we're going to see more and more real world robotics AI applications that need something that is built much more like Dojo than what NVIDIA is currently doing. We have a lot to cover, especially all these new developments about Tesla's AI and a lot about comparison to Waymo and Tesla's RoboTaxi. So let's go ahead and watch um, Elon being interviewed about the All In Summit. And he talked about Tesla's AI team and their dojo. Turned on Colossus, which yeah. is like the largest private compute cluster, I guess, of GPUs anywhere. Is that, uh, thing, yes, is that right? It's, it's, the, it's the most powerful supercomputer of any kind. Um, which sort of speaks to what David said and kind of what Peter said, which is a lot of the kind of economic value so far of AI, AI has entirely gone to NVIDIA. But there are people with alternatives, and you're actually one with an alternative. Now, you have a very specific case because Dojo is really about images and large images, huge video. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the Tesla problem is different from the, um, you know, the sort of LLM problem. Uh, the, the nature of the intelligence actually is actually, and, and the, what, what matters in the AI is, is different um, to, to the point you just made, which is that in, the, in Tesla's case, the context uh, length is very long. So we've got gigabytes of context. Gigabyte context windows, yeah. Yeah, you've got, you know, sort of, uh, well, I was just bringing it up. Kind of billions of tokens of context, right. not, not any amount of context, because you've got um, seven seven cameras, and if, if you've got several, you know, let's say you've got a, a minute of several high def, high def cameras, then that's gigabytes. So you, you need to compress. And so the Tesla problem is you've got to compress a, a gigantic context um, into the the pixels that are that actually matter, um, and you know, and 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 condense that. Over a time, so you've got to, in, in both uh, the time dimension and the space dimension, you've got to compress the pixels uh, in, in space and the pixels over in time, um, and, and, and then and then have that inference done on a tiny computer, relatively speaking, a small, like a, you know, a few hundred watts. Uh, it's a Tesla-designed AI inference computer, uh, which is by the way still the best. There, there isn't a better thing we could buy from suppliers. So the Tesla-designed. Uh, AI and first computer that's in the cars is better than anything we, we could buy from any supplier. Just by the way, that's kind of a. Well, by the way, you know, in, the, the, the Tesla AI, the AI chip team is extremely good. Well, you guys, in the design, there was a technical paper and there was a deck that somebody on your team from Tesla published, and it was stunning to me. You designed your own transport control, like layer over Ethernet. You were like, ah, oh, Ethernet's not good enough for us. Yeah. So you have this TT. COE or something, and you're like, oh, we're just going to reinvent Ethernet and like string these chips. It's pretty incredible stuff that's happening over there. Yeah. Um, no, the team, the, the, the Tesla chip design team is extremely, extremely good. Um, so. Um, but is there a world where, for example, other people over time that need, you know, some sort of like video use case or image yeah, use yeah. case so, could so, theoretically, you know, you'd say, oh, yeah. why not? You know, I have some extra cycles over here. So. It, which should kind of make you a competitor of NVIDIA. It's not intentionally per se, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the you know, there's this training and inference, and we, we, we do have the, you know, two, those two projects at Tesla. We've got Dojo, which is the, the training computer, uh, and then, um, you know, our inference chip, which is in every, every car, inference computer. Um, so, and a dojo, we've only had dojo one. Dojo two is, um, you know, should be, we should have dojo two in volume towards the end of next year. Um, and and that, that, that will be, we, we think, sort of co comparable to uh, the, sort of a B200 type, type system, a training system. Um, and, um, you know, so there's, I guess there's some potential for, for that to be used as a service. Um, uh, but, but, but like, you know, Do Do Dojo is, is, is just kind of like, I mean, we're, we're, we're I, guess, I, I guess I have like some improved confidence in Dojo, um, but I think we, we won't really know how good Dojo is until probably version three. Like it usually takes three major iterations on a technology for it to be, to be excellent, mm -hmm. um, and we'll only have the second major iteration next year. Um, the third iteration, I don't know, maybe late, you know, 26 or something like that. How's the, uh, how's the, okay. So he said quite a number of things here. He'll have more improved confidence in Dojo. It could be possibly used as service. 
and it's going to do Dojo 2 late next year. Uh, any thoughts on what you heard? Yeah, there's a number of interesting things. If we want to, you know, maybe start with the last thing and go backwards on Dojo. It's interesting to me that he said that Dojo V2 could be done next year and that they could be entering production on it because um, we've heard from TSMC that they have the special process that Dojo is operating on is a system on wafer with chip on wafer integrated on, into it. So all that to say they're um, doing several layers of stacking in the vertical axis on these chips um, in order to achieve better networking and you know better performance. One of the things that we heard from TSMC this year is that Dojo is the first chip to use this new process where they're doing chip on wafer on substrate. And what that allows them to do is have some 3D stacking of some elements um, and use basically a wafer scale size chip in the Dojo D1 tiles. Um, <clears throat> there is a further iteration of that where they're actually able to put the high bandwidth memory chips on top of chips that are then in this big tile. And that is a pathway to doing a 40X on the performance of current Dojo chips. But they've said that that is not going to come online until I believe they said 2026 or 2027. And so if we stack that up with Elon's timeline of saying that version three of Dojo would be 2026, then my guess is what he's saying is that, you know, on the optimistic end of things, that Dojo version three would be the one that actually takes advantage of that next iteration of TSMC's process where they can go ahead and integrate their high bandwidth memory on top of their chips. And so that means we've got a Dojo V2 iteration that we haven't seen yet that is an increase in performance from here, but it doesn't go all the way to that 40X performance increase um, that TSMC implied. And so I think that's you know interesting in a, a couple of, um, dimensions but i would say that you know elon is remaining very cautious here on the development of dojo and its ability to be competitive especially for a general use cases um i will be surprised personally if dojo is something that people are going to want to train on to develop tools that are competitive with chat gpt that are strictly llms but i do think it is purpose built for and has a good potential to outcompete NVIDIA over time in training that is video based. And I think there's going to be a lot of real world use cases that all move towards video based training. And whether that's going to be for Optimus, whether that's going to be for full self driving type applications, we're going to see more and more real world robotics AI applications that need something that is built much more like Dojo than what NVIDIA is currently doing. Um, and so I think by the time we get to that V3 of Dojo, there's a good shot that that market could actually be growing relative to the market for other AI applications. Um, and that could make that demand for Dojo style chips um, to be something that is competing with and potentially even eclipsing the chat GPT style, you know, very abstract. We're working with language and and that goes back to the point that Elon was making that was dealing with the type of challenge that Tesla's facing in doing full self-driving, where you know instead of having language, which is pretty easily compressed down into tokens, you can have lots and lots and lots of information that are stored in megabytes of data instead of video data, where you have gigabytes or terabytes of data, um, that those type of applications, are they're just different. And so Tesla solving that challenge, I think, really opens up the doorway long term um, to, you know, an entirely different type of AI related product. Thank you for explaining that. I think it's uh, obviously good news. It's sounding like he's much more confident about it. He did say that we won't know for sure how great Dojo is until the third iteration. So that's like a year, two years away from now. But that's talking about whether it's going to be used for, for like selling it as a service regardless, on the way for helping it now too. So other news, of course, Elon was correct when he talked about LiDAR, and we're seeing more and more information about that. Here's Mobileye announcing that they're going to end the internal LiDAR development. Um, they are a maker of autonomous um, technology that other companies can license from them. 
And, uh, you know, this is, this is it. They've basically chosen to end the internal development of next-gen frequency modulated continuous wave LIDARs. Now, some people are saying, well, they're just ending it and they're just going to buy it outsourced. Doesn't mean that they don't really think it's, it's correct. But if you look at what they actually say, they go, we now believe that the availability of LIDAR is less essential to our roadmap for eyes off systems. Okay. So it's less essential based on a variety of factors. One is our own vision, computer vision perception is progressing quite nicely. We have increased clarity and the performance of our internally developed imaging radar. And we have continued cost reductions on third party LIDAR units. So we don't need to do it ourselves. Um, it looks like that they're going to uh, lay off about 100 employees by the end of 2024. Uh, that's their moving. In the meantime, time, a reminder that in 2019, uh, Elon said, LIDAR is a fool's errand. Anyone relying on LIDAR is doomed. Uh, expensive sensors that are unnecessary, you'll see. And he was, he looks like he's being cor uh, called correctly because you're seeing a lot of companies now announcing they're pulling away from LIDAR. <laughs> Elon just knows what he's talking about. Here's Xiaopeng recently announced their plans to ditch LIDAR. Now, of course, you got Mobileye saying this, and then Luminar laid off 20% of their employees. Business is struggling. So here is um, Elon talking about LIDAR. What we're going to explain to you today is that LIDAR is, is a fool's errand, and, any, and anyone relying on LIDAR is doomed. <laughs> doomed. Expensive, expensive sensors that are, are unnecessary. It's like having a whole bunch of expensive appendices. Like one appendix is bad, well, now they want to put a whole bunch of them. That's ridiculous. You'll see. Yeah. And then uh, he replied to that news uh, yesterday. He said that, you know, it make, LIDAR looks smart if you think about fuel cells and hydrogen combustor cars as well. So these are things that the uh, OEMs are doing, fuel cells, hydrogen, LIDAR, and he's saying these are all wrong, and then he's going to be proven correct. And so far, it's looking like he's correct. Yeah, I just think it's funny that this is still a conversation. I mean, so the thing that made this blatantly obvious back when he started to make these predictions is that you know, you have to have vision. You can't drive the car without vision because there's a lot of things that LIDAR just doesn't give you. You know, it doesn't give you um, what your road signs say. It gives you locations of objects, but then any contextual data that's beyond that, it doesn't provide. Uh, so, you know, can't read the lines on the road, for instance. And so you have to have vision in order to drive. It's just um impossible not to do it without that and so then okay if you have to have vision the question is can you do with vision what you accomplish with lidar as far as locating objects in the scene and all your drivable space and all that stuff and the answer is with enough intelligence absolutely you can do that um and so mm -hmm. when you really look at it and say okay hey cameras they're way cheaper than lidar sensors and they give you light that travels in the same wavelength as these LIDAR light waves do. And we can, with intelligence, transform that into the same end result as we would get with LIDAR, then why don't we just do that? And we'll use, you know, $10, $15 camera sensors instead of tens of thousands of dollars for these LIDAR sensors. Um, and, and we just have to be really good at software, which we're already going to have to be really good at. Like, you know, the entire FSD problem is a huge software problem. And thinking that you can solve a huge software problem by sucking at the intelligence piece of it and then supplementing your suckiness with these super expensive <laughs> sensors is just ridiculous. And, you know, we, after um, the ImageNet competition back in 2012, where we saw that neural nets can understand, you know, the difference in cats versus dogs um, just through neural networks it's like oh this is the final piece like we we have to have neural nets that can understand the world uh through these cameras and that was the the piece that unlocked the capability to do what we're doing and you just have to say we have to be really really good at that thing and once we are then this is solved and it makes the lidar irrelevant and that's yeah. been you know elon's position for a long time I think from first principles, it's been obvious for a long time. Um, a lot of people just are still pursuing the sunk cost fallacy that they've invested a lot in this technology, 
uh, whether it's from, you know, their ecosystem depends on it, or they are directly invested in the LIDARs themselves. And they are continuing to pursue this thing well past the point where it yeah. should just be left by the wayside. Don't know why they're doing it, but uh, they've invested, like you said. Okay, so let's watch uh, Andre Kapathy, the ex-director of Autopilot for Tesla. He was interviewed recently, and he talked about the difference between Tesla and Waymo. Um, it's awesome to listen to him talk about it because, again, it's not just Elon, right? This is actual people that work at Tesla. When you hear what they say, you you kind of uh, kind of put everything a little bit pieces together closely. The first time I took Waymo was actually a decade ago, almost exactly, 2014 or so. And it was a friend of mine who worked there and he gave me a demo. And it drove me around the block 10 years ago. And it was basically perfect drive 10 years ago. And it took 10 years to go from like a demo that I had to a product I can pay for that's in the city scale and it's expanding, etc. I think personally Tesla is ahead of Waymo and I know it doesn't look like that, uh, but I'm still very uh, bullish on Tesla and its self-driving program. I think that Tesla has a software problem and I think Waymo has a hardware problem, is the way I put it. And I think software problems are much easier. Tesla has a deployment of all these cars on Earth, uh, like at scale. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Waymo needs to get there. And so uh, the moment Tesla sort of like gets to the point where they can actually deploy this and it actually works, I think it's going to be, you know, uh, really incredible. How far away do you think we are from the software problem turning the corner in terms of getting to some equivalency? Because obviously, to your point, if you look at a Waymo car, it has a lot of very expensive LiDAR and other sort of sensors built into the car so it can do what it does. It sort of helps support the software system. And so if you could just use cameras, which is the Tesla approach, then you effectively get rid of enormous costs slash complexity, and you can do it in, in many different types of cars. When do you think that transition happens? I mean, in the next few years, I mean, I'm hoping or like something like that. But actually, what's really interesting about that is I'm not sure that people are appreciating that Tesla actually does use a lot of expensive sensors. They just do it at training time. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of cars that drive around with LiDARs. Mm -hmm. They do a bunch of stuff that like doesn't scale and they have extra sensors, et cetera. And they do mapping and all, all this stuff. You're doing it at training time and then you're distilling that into a test time package that gets deployed to the cars and is vision only. And it's like an arbitrage on like sensors uh, and like expense. Yeah. And so I think it's actually kind of a brilliant strategy that I don't think is fully appreciated. And I think it's going to work out well because the pixels have the information. And I think uh, the network will be capable of doing that. Yeah, there you go. Love, love it, love it, love it. So you're using it at the training time. And then he talked about how, um, you know, Waymo's hardware problem has not been solved. They're still out there creating, the, the price is supposed to fall dramatically. It hasn't happened. Meanwhile, we're seeing progress with software problem for Tesla. Thoughts on that? Yeah, and I mean, even if they solve their hardware problem in terms of cost, they're still dependent on some, you know, external manufacturer in order to be able to supply them with, I mean, Tesla has... 5 million plus vehicles on the road that if the software problem is solved can instantly turn into robo taxis. You know, Waymo has a couple of thousand cars and, you know, definitely in the tens of thousands, maybe hundred thousand at maximum um, cars total in their fleet. And so, you know, you're talking about many orders of magnitude in difference between the sizes of those fleets. And that to me is a huge risk. If I'm an investor in Waymo is like, how are you going to get to this very large number of vehicles deployed um, based on like, who, who are your partners? What's their ability to scale to large volumes? And man, it sure seems like whoever that person is has, you know, leverage over you in your overall business strategy. And, you know, there's lots of just big question marks on that front that to me seem like they are very much unsolved. Um, and, you know, prototypes are easy. Production is hard. If I had to pick one or the other problem to have, I'd rather have the software problem to solve mm -hmm. than the hardware okay. one.